Uh, I think this was yesterday, right? Oh, no, this was actually three days ago. I missed this. So Matt Owens, the executive producer of One Piece, did an AMA. I don't really think anything super big came out of this, because uh, I think I would have seen it. I think the only thing that I can already say for certain is people immediately asked whether or not Logtown is skipped, and Matt Owens just said no. You know, we, we didn't do it for season one because we just didn't have time, you know? And the reason why people ask that is because the barrel scene happens at the end of season one, whereas in the anime and in the manga, it only happens after Logtown, right? So one thing I've already heard from this is he is 1 million percent confirmed. There is like no intention of skipping Logtown, which I fully expected. I never thought they'd actually skip it, which is fine. Uh, all right, let's get into it, I guess. So we can read through some of the top ones, at least. How hard was it to really nail the tone the way you did? It was incredibly hard. One Piece is such a wacky tone, and we wanted to maintain it as much as possible without alienating people. That was really one of the biggest challenges. Remember, uh, remember with that guy, uh, I can't seem to recall his name. Uh, I think it was something like Kuroto's Mystery Shack. He did a video on live-action adaptations, and, you know, um, the one thing he talked about for, like, 20 minutes is, uh, you know, tone. Um, so, you know, fun funny that Matt Owens talks about that a lot as well. <laughs> but yeah, like, this is exactly what I meant as well. Uh, the reason why I really doubted the One Piece adaptation right from the get-go is the world and the tone of it, you know? That's why I was spooked. Let me zoom in a bit more. How many of your sets were practical versus CGI, especially the outdoor and ship sets? Uh, so we've seen this because we, we already saw the ships literally being built, right? Um, the majority of our sets are practical. Uh, our design and construction uh, teams did an amazing job bringing the world to life in a way that feels real. Of course, there was some VFX here and there, but we never had our actors just standing in front of a green screen. Uh, there was always something to uh, for them to look at and interact with. Which, by the way, this is the biggest thing. Uh, yeah, he also says this himself. It helps the for, uh, performance and it uh, helps the world feel tangible and real. Uh, this is always the biggest thing people talk about. Like, when an actor just has to talk to nothing, it's hard. Usually there is someone standing like, just like as a step in. You know, just to give them something to bounce off of. Because talking to a fictional character that you need to imagine in your brain, when you're already acting as a different character, it's hard. Uh, so that is like the biggest thing. If you look at behind the scenes, even when they're talking to like a fully CG model, usually there is someone like stepping in to give them something to bounce off of. Uh, the ships are real? Yes, it's true. Um, I said this before, I saw the Baratier ship, I want to go there. I want to just chill in the real Baratier. Someone make it happen, please. Uh, you could walk on all of them. Some of them were actually in water and some were not. I'm surprised that they actually made a lot of them in water. Tone is so important. That's the main reason Cowboy Bebop uh, live action stunk. For Cowboy Cowboy Bebop, I don't don't even really think it's it's the tone that much. I think the tone was fine. I think it's um it didn't have any subtlety, which was like the heart and soul of the anime. You know, I've talked a bunch about it in the video as well about Cowboy Bebop. Uh, as a fan of the comics slash manga, which, <laughs> I love how people, <laughs> there's so many people who get angry when you call um, One Piece a comic. I find that so amusing. Uh, I think you're the secret sauce to these live action adaptations. Uh, what advice would you give to the showrunners of future adaptations of beloved manga or comics? Uh, that is so nice of you to say, I really appreciate that. Uh, I try to bring my love and respect uh, for the material to my work, uh, and it means that a lot of it uh, is appreciated. Truly, thank you. Very good. My advice would be to fight for what you believe in. If you're adapting something that you legitimately love, fight for what it needs to be. Big true. Stay as true as possible while also understanding that you're not uh, not only not the only voice and you may not always win, but your fandom and knowledge are powerful weapons. Very good. Very good. This is true. I loved little Easter eggs in the show, like Zoro getting lost. Which, by the way, some, someone um, someone did a post, like, analyzing just how lost Zoro got. Uh, it was in uh, episode 3 and 4, right? Yeah, 3 and 4, because it was the, uh, it was the Sura Village arc. I can't remember what it even was. But, like, the fact that he ended up where he did, he must have gone. <laughs> like, so it was ridiculous, basically. There's a post on Reddit. Someone actually analyzed uh, what he did to get there. It's very, very goofy. Oh, this is talking about hallway, never mind. Or Usa being able to see the Baratie side right away. Uh, what was your favorite? Oh, I didn't even catch this. The fact that Usopp is the one to see the sign. I didn't even catch that. That's good. I like that. Uh, what was your favorite Easter egg included in the show so far? Thank you for your work in bringing One Piece to a wider audience. 
Easter eggs were such a fun part of the show. I love talking to different departments, to plants as much as we could. My favorite is probably the bounty posters that fill the world. Yes. This is so good. I love this so much. It again just, um, it's like the bounty poster specifically is like the ultimate example of foresight. This is exactly what I said. Uh, if you remember, if you go back to my uh, Logtown video of the anime, I was wrong, but the idea still stands. We saw a couple of wanted posters in the background, and I was immediately like, these characters 100% pop up. This is 1 million percent foreshadowing, right? You don't just put a random dude on a random wanted poster in the background. You just don't do that. This is why I always say, the smallest of details, people say they don't care. You always have to remember that someone sat down and made the deliberate decision to include it. So why would you include it? Well, it must be relevant, right? I was wrong this time. It was just flavor. But the point still stands. It just makes the world feel that much bigger. It immediately gives you like a glimpse of what else is out there. And I love that. Uh, the well was inside of the house. Somehow Zoro ended up uh, bumping into Luffy and the Marines in the woods. Yes, yes. Someone tried mapping it out. It was insane. Because um, when I first finished the season, I was like, we got to see a little bit of Zoro getting, uh, getting lost, right? But I didn't really get it. I didn't really have that sense so explicitly. But then I saw that post and I was like, oh, it just flew over my head a little bit. He did get lost. And like, not a little bit lost, but like, ridiculously lost, which is great. Um, I looked back, which by the way, I love the theories people have about like him, uh, him being the um, the log post like uh, Laugh Tale and stuff. I love those so much. I want I want one of these gimmicks to actually turn out to be true. I think it'd be really really goofy. Uh, I look back at pirates who we uh, know were operating at this time in the story and what their bounties would be. Very good. Uh, it helps sell other pirates to newcomers uh, and are fun details for fans who know who they are. Very true. Uh, not all the ones who made got shown on screen, uh, but be on the lookout basically in the next seasons. Okay. Okay. I wonder who else could it be? Because we got like characters like Bellamy. That's like season three, right? Foxy. Foxy's probably season four. Wonder who else it could have been. Maybe maybe someone from Baroque Works or something. Something like that might be it. Uh, all right. Uh, at which point in the story did you fall in love with One Piece? What's your favorite character? Uh, thank you for respecting the source material. I could have never convinced my uh, boyfriend to watch One Piece, uh, but I can share the characters I love with your show. Big true. Again, opening it up, uh, opening it up to a new audience. Universal W. So glad you could share this with your boyfriend now. Hearing people being able to share One Piece with their loved ones always brings me so much joy. Yeah. The first thing in One Piece that really made me lean in was Sanji, a character who loves cooking so much that he refuses to fight with his hands because if they get injured, then he can't cook. Which, by the way, I love this detail. It's a cool little detail. There is that one time in G8 where he tries to use a dial, but that's filler, so it doesn't count. And I guess he does use knives in Water 7, but that was kind of the point. Not only is that such a powerful commitment to his dream that really informs what's important to him, but it also allows for a very unique fighting style. Very true. Uh, Sanji fights are some of my favorites in the whole series. But the moment that uh, first really hooked me was, of course, Nami... Uh, Sami's. <laughs> Nami's helped me. To this day, I tear up just thinking about it. Yes. This is like, this is pretty universal, I think. For most people, it's it's either the Baratier and Sanji's flashback, it is Zoro's story, uh, for some it is obviously just like Luffy and Shanks right from the get-go, and finally it is Nami's help me. If those if those things don't hook you, I, I genuinely think that just like, no, it, it, this won't be for you. I think so. Uh, favorite characters though in the manga slash anime, Law and Robin. Very good picks. Very, very good picks. I can respect that. I can respect that. In the live action, Mihawk and Sanji. I kind of agree. I kind I kind of agree with all four of these. I'm not going to lie. Like I would replace Law with Chopper because of course I would. Um but I think my favorites in live action are actually Mihawk and Sanji. <laughs> Did anyone ask him if he's going to cast Emily Rudd as Vivi in season 2? Um I'm kind of I kind of really really hope that that is the case somewhere. Let's see. Because yes, um, that was my favorite thing that immediately people said, like fan casting of uh, Vivi, and it's just a picture of Emily Rudd and her hair color is just blue. It's so good. Uh, all right, I'm wondering with oh this is this is good, this is good. I want to know about this. Uh, with certain knowledge that we now have from the current manga lore, will more of that information be sprinkled work into the live action? Uh, not only for the OG One Piece fans um, to point out and go, oh, so this is the Leo meme basically. This was me 
for all of uh, all of live action, basically. Uh, but just so new fans can theorize debates with those interesting details, i.e. hinting more about Sanji's past, uh, subtly of course, or Lily, incorporating a certain character a bit more when Ace shows up, things like that. I think they should. I think they absolutely should. I think this would be really, really cool if they start throwing in things that are like from, from chapter 1050. I said this before, let's just get to Skypea and make the foreshadowing so explicit that no one can argue against it. Let's just, let's just make it so blatant that there's like no debate. I want them to do that. I think it'd be cool. Uh, but yeah, like they can name drop certain things and for someone watching the series for the first time, it won't mean anything, you know? Like Nika, what does that mean? No one knows what it means, but they can name drop it. They can. Uh, it would be such a great gag, especially if they don't even acknowledge that it's the same person. Those are my favorite type of gags. I think people on the internet, a lot of people don't get it. When you don't acknowledge a joke, they get mad. But that's how I do jokes. I say something stupid and I just go with it. <laughs> I never acknowledge it. It's just like, wait, wait, it's just, it's just Emily Rudd again, but with blue hair. It's just like, what do you mean? It's Vivi. What do you mean? It's, what, what do you mean it's Nami? No, it's Vivi. But they're completely different people. What do you mean? The only problem with that would be like, they would have to do VFX for every single scene both of them are in. It wouldn't work. Uh, that's one of the benefits of the manga existing for so long before the adaptation. We have a lot more information about people and events, which by the way, um, I already saw Wano somewhere, right? Wano is name dropped for the first time, I believe in Thriller Bark. And I was talking about it as soon as Thriller Bark happened. I think Thriller Bark is the first time. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure Thriller Bark is the first time. I want them to name drop things, uh, adding details that are accurate that weren't even in the manga at the time. Uh, for example, during a <laughs> wacko arc, uh, in the manga it's revealed that Shanks and the crew stole the gum gum fruits uh, from who's who and the marines. When I read that, uh, I sprinted to our props department and said, uh, I know we already have a chest for the devil fruits, but we have to make a brand new one and it needs to, the marine insignia on it. Sorry, this is good. Uh, then I wrote some of the new lines to speak to that. The manga was constantly seeking to our show, which by the way, this kind of confirms that there is no fishy business going on behind the scenes, I think. Because what I was thinking is what if Oda is cheekily giving out... Because, you know, like, the anime has sometimes spoiled things that are not in the manga yet. Because the anime is a much larger production. It obviously takes longer to produce. They are far, far ahead. And I was thinking, what if that is the case for the live-action version? Like, what if Season 3 rolls around? And suddenly something is mentioned, and we're like, wait, 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 hold up. What was that? And then in a hundred chapters, we see it in the manga. But I guess this confirms that that is not the case. Uh, they can name drop Wano next season since they introduced Seastone in the saga. Yes. Yes. That'd be cool. Actual Nika mentions in Skypea. I'd be down. If it's literally, like, you can even have it like Robin just trying to read cryptic texts. Right? She literally just reads something. And it's like Nika, something, 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 Gold Roger, something, 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 something. And she just keeps reading and it's still a mystery, but it's there. And when it's revealed, obviously Wado, you know, let's, let's not get our hopes up. It would take like 10 years, probably 15 to get there. But if we get there and it's revealed, that's when you know things get real. I'm absolutely down for, for like explicit mentions. Uh, all right, Yo Mesh, from another fan who found One Piece at an incredible low point and was inspired to keep going by the pure good that it embodies. Thank you for bringing the series to new audiences and giving it the love and attention that it deserves. Uh, what was the most surprising aspect in working with Ichiro Oda? He has such a unique vision. I'm really curious how he responds to dailies or proposed changes. The most surprising uh, aspect of working with Oda is how well we gelled and collaborated. Is this how you spell gelled? I think so. Uh, not that I expected different, but his engagement was not just informative and important, but fun. We have spent hours talking about the intricacies of One Piece. Well, I mean, I would assume so, <laughs> you know, considering how big it is. Uh, characters, history, all sorts of things. Uh, we also talked a lot about movies and books and anime. You know how, like, an author is a nerd when they just start talking about random things they enjoy. Which, by the way... <clears throat> I think some of the best authors usually take inspiration from things that are like, that have like nothing to do with what they're actually working on. I love, I love when just like an author references something from like an obscure comic book 
that is like 34 years old and it's like, yeah, I saw this. I thought it was kind of neat, so I included it in my video uh, in my video game story. And it's like, oh, I like these sorts of cross medium inspirations. Uh, we learn how much um, each other think and birth a very creative partnership. I always look forward to our talks because we learn so much from one another and it made for a better show. I really cannot express enough my love for him. Nice. So basically what we learned is Oda is also a nerd. Very good. What was it like watching the chemistry between the cast come to life on screen? At what point did you feel? Yeah, they're a crew. Um, it happened even before the cameras rolled. The cast was down in South Af Africa for training, rehearsals, costume fittings, etc. Months before we even started shooting. Uh, they would go hiking together, uh, explore Cape Town together, and you could uh, see their closeness developing. They formed real friendships that translated to, to the screen beautifully. Which, by the way, these sorts of things, super important, I think. Uh, if, if you can get people together even before you start working on the show and just like get to know them, you know, uh, this is the same thing that happened with Avatar. They were doing reshoots just because of how um, how well like people started to get to know each other. They developed such a good dynamic that they just went back and reshot some of the scenes to feel more authentic. Uh, it's from what, I, uh, from what I've heard, basically. No surprise, just look at his house. I've seen things in his house and it's insane. I heard the story of like the TV. What, what was it? It was like 80 inch TV or 100 inch TV or something like that. And like they couldn't put it in, so they destroyed a wall or something. <laughs> I, I, I remember seeing something like that and I was like, damn, damn. Uh, they can name drop more lore in season two about ancient weapons and Joy Boy. I think maybe Joy Boy should be kept in the shadows a little bit, but I think the god Nika can be name dropped. I think the like the personality of Joy Boy could be kept a little bit longer so we can establish that link later. But I'm not sure though. It really depends on how they how they go with the whole thing. Um, one of the things that a show like this lives and dies by is the chemistry between the crew, so I couldn't be happier. Exactly. Like if you can if you can just get your actors together and have them just do random things, it's great. Uh, all right. Uh, some of their dynamics as the Straw Hats even started to blend into their real world friendships. Emily is everyone's big sister. Well, let's let's hope Emily IRL doesn't have uh, advanced conquerors hockey. You know, well, let's just. <laughs> Let's hope there's none of that. Uh, all right. Uh, I imagine you've got to be pretty tight-lipped about upcoming seasons of the show, uh, but these are technically questions about the manga, I think. Uh, any currently far in the future characters that you'd uh, really uh, that you'd be really excited to adapt uh, at the opportunity to adapt? Uh, all right, let's go. Let's go one by one. I really want to get to law. I love that broody boy so much. I mean, he's basically a Levi. He's great uh, because it's a fun design and it'd be uh, a nice challenge. And because I love her, um, uh, I also want uh, to get to ca uh, Carrot. Carrot for Nakama. Let's, let's not, let's not, let's not get into, um, you know, let's not, let's not open up this can of worms again, you know? Let's, let's, let's leave that for Oda to decide for now. <laughs> oh, this was a fun time. This was a fun time. Rem remember these days? When it was, who's gonna be your next crewmate? And then we didn't get any new crewmates. <laughs> Wasn't that a fun time? When was that? Last summer? Summer before that? Something like that. Uh, any manga arc slash subplots that really fuel um, your stated desire to adapt as much of the source material as possible? Uh, Skypea would be a blast. To spend a whole season in one of the most creative worlds Oda created would be a lot of fun. Big true. Uh, Adaptation-wise, are you more intimidated by post Timeskip Frankie? Or G4. Oh, Gear 4. Uh, probably post time skip Frankie, to be honest. He's on screen more. Yes. 100%. Because Gear 4 is a battle thing, you know? A battle thing will by default be expensive and will by default require a lot of effects. So Gear 4 is kind of, we know it's going to be hard. So we sort of just like, it is what it is. Post time skip Frankie is just a nightmare. How are you going to do post time skip Frankie? He's going to look like a World of Warcraft character. Is gonna be insane. <laughs> I love this so much, though. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I want to. I want to hear what Matt had to say um, at the end of Wano. I want to hear his thoughts on the uh, on the climax and uh, what happened there. I'm sure he was very happy. All right. Uh, not including our main five, who was the most difficult character to cast, and what was the challenge? Zeph was particularly uh, difficult for us to find the right person. It was actually Taz who suggested Craig Fairbrass uh, to us. They had worked together before. Oh, so this is good. So they already had a dynamic formed. 
That's good. Uh, Craig did only one reading and we were like, oh, thank God we found him. He's perfect. Great. Uh, and since he and Taz knew each other and had worked um, with one another before, they brought added layers to Sanji and uh, Zeph relationship that really sparked on screen. Yeah, again, so this is another another case of like translating, translating like a pre-existing relationship to screen. You know, this is really, really good. Uh, which, by the way, uh, the same thing happened with um, with the Uncle Iroh voice actor and... Uh, oh my god, I forget their names. The Uncle Iroh voice actor and the Zuko voice actor. Um, Dante Bosco, right? That's the, that's the Zuko voice actor. I'm so bad with names. I'm so bad with names. So th that is a universal W. Wait, this is, uh, this is two. Okay. In One Piece, we'll often say goodbye to characters. Okay, this is important. This is important. We'll say goodbye to characters and not see them again for 100, 200 more chapters. Do you plan to create original material to give ca uh, to characters like Kobe, Buggy, Ace, or Garp stuff to do in seasons they otherwise wouldn't appear in? So this is what I said. This is what I've said many times. This is the fundamental problem with live action adaptations. This is not an anime where you can draw stuff in 50 years later. These are living, living beings that you need to either employ or you need to let them go. And if you let them go, you might not get them back. This is what has happened with The Walking Dead. This is what has happened with like Game of Thrones. This is what has happened with every single show out there. So what are we going to do with Kobe, who appears once every 400 chapters? Let's hear what he has to say. Uh, if the show got successful enough, they could have these characters in spin-offs. Perhaps Netflix started, uh, stated they want uh, their Star Wars. More Zeph, please. Uh, I would love for that to be the case. There are so many stories we have yet to fully dive into. I'd love to do young... A young Mihawk series. I want that. Imagine, imagine if the place where we finally get the answers to why was Mihawk a warlord without a crew? Did Mihawk ever have a crew? Who the hell even is Mihawk? Why does he look like a vampire? Why does he live alone like a vampire? Like all the questions we would have about Mihawk. Imagine if the if the place where we learn of all of that is in live action. I think it'd be badass. I'd be down. I'd be down. Yeah, but I feel like spin-offs could work. I'm not sure, like, um... I think the easiest answer is obviously, um, whatchamacallit, cover stories, right? That is material that's written by Oda, and is just waiting there to be adapted. So cover stories make sense. A lot of the cover stories, the problem is they take, take place so, so much, uh, so much in the future, right? So a lot of them we just can't touch because, I mean, they happen years later. But this I like. I like this idea. Also, you know the meme of Two Piece being about a marine boy? <laughs> imagine if they imagine if they give Kobe a Kobe a spin-off and it's literally two piece. <laughs> it's just literally two piece. <laughs> uh, I would only like it if Oda wrote the script entirely. I don't want to say I would only like it if Oda wrote it entirely, because that would be a lie. If they just write a good story for Mihawk, I'd be fine with it. But like, if we if we look at everything Matt has said so far, I think he runs everything by Oda anyway. So if they write a story and Oda is like, you know, I dig this. How about we workshop this a little more? I'll give you a few ideas and then I'll incorporate this into the manga as well. And we'll sort of make this a collaborative effort. I think it'd be great. I think it'd be, uh, I think it'd be perfectly fine. Even if it's not like, and keep in mind, even if it's not a story written by completely Oda, the live action adaptation is, is still its own entity. If it's not important, you know, uh, in the sense that, oh no, that doesn't actually work. Basically, what I'm saying is I don't want to make an absolute blanket statement that I would only want Oda to write it. If it's fun, I don't really care. Because again, we still have the manga, we still have the anime. Of course, I want it to be faithful. But I'd rather, like, let me, let me put it this way. I'd rather have them employ Mihawk's actor and make a fake story for the live action adaptation then, like, get rid of Mihawk completely because he wants to work on other things. That is, like, the best way I think I can put it. I'd rather just them come up with something com complete nonsense just to keep him on a contract and just to keep him in the series. Because fact of the matter is, as much as I want us to get to Wano and beyond, the chances, I think, are relatively slim. So how about we make the best of it while we still have it? You know, th this is the way I think about things. We'll see what happens. Uh, during season three, they can just do Ace cover story in the background and essentially have him uh, in every season up to his death. Yes. Also, isn't there the Ace novel, which I still haven't read? There's a there's a book about Ace, right? I haven't read it. I should read it. Don't have time to read books. 
If there was an if there was an audiobook of that, I'd listen to it in like three days. It'd be great. But I don't. Basically, I think spin-offs could work. Uh, power scalers would go wild with the material in the No one cares about power scalers. Literally not a single person on this planet cares about power scalers. You know why? Because the pa most powerful character is the protagonist. If he's not the most powerful today, he'll, he will be in a month. If he won't be in a month, he will be in three months. There are very, very few series where the protagonist doesn't have the ultimate plot armor. Very few. Very, very few. Um, you said in your deadline, and I just realized that it's like, a, I, I, I absolutely just angered so many people. It's great. Um, you said in your deadline interview that you were bummed uh, not to get to interact and share the praise uh, the show got while it was happening most due to the... Uh, I still, I'm still not... In, I think this is Writer's Guild of America. I think so. Uh, do you have a favorite review um, you remember reading or fan comment on the show that you'd like to share? He's going to mention that the world-renowned creator of Kurodo's Mystery Shack, right? Um, I rewatched the series three times already and love the amount of care and detail that went into everything. A wonderful work of adaptation that I seriously put in the same tier as The Hunger Games uh, and the third Harry Potter movie in terms of effective use of medium shift. Thank you for your work. The third movie of Harry Potter is kind of an odd one. Prisoner of Azkaban is kind of odd. The, like, Prisoner of Azkaban was a big shift in tone, but it's still an odd thing to focus on. Anyway, anyway, who cares? Uh, I'm not sure I have one favorite review. See what you did there. It's like, it's like this. This is one of those cases where someone asks you for a favorite, and you're like, "Oh my god!" Like I can't win in this situation. If I say a name, I will make everyone else uh, like unhappy. You know, because I didn't say them. This is a good answer. Uh, but I do love seeing content creators who were um, who were shitting on the show before it came out and talking about how impossible it would be to do now, saying how much they enjoyed it. Which, by the way, this anyone who is willing, people laugh about these people. I was technically one of them. I never said like, it's gonna be horrible. I always take a balanced stance on these things. I like to I like to think that I am always fair and balanced, you know? I said, I don't think it'll be good, but I never said, I think it's going to be bad. I raised my concerns with the show. A lot of them turned out to be completely unfounded and it was great. I think all the concerns I raised were valid. I never said it's just gonna be bad for the sake of being bad. But that's not what the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that anybody who is willing to say I was wrong, it's good, gets an automatic W from me. Because you know what? They actually admitted they were wrong. There are so many people who are scared of saying that they were wrong that they will just keep running with the idea of, well, actually, you might say it's good, but it's actually good for fans. And I was right all along and I still don't like it. That's the people I hate. It's like people who are who are so afraid of saying like, no, you know what? I was actually wrong. It's like, no, no, no. I'll just keep I'll just keep peddling the same thing because uh, I said it once. Now I need to keep up with it. Um, my less petty answer is that I love all of it. I'm so grateful that people have enjoyed what we worked on uh, very hard to bring to life. People who don't watch anime or have friends slash family who don't. Uh, there's there's a comma missing. That's why I, I got confused. Now being able to share uh, the wonder that is One Piece fills my heart. Yes. I mean, of course. I mean, how can you not be happy about proving, like, millions of people wrong? Like, imagine, imagine not feeling like an absolute giga chat when you literally prove millions of people wrong. It, it's gotta feel good. It's gotta be, gotta feel good. Content creators that say it was good, but... I think it's, I think it's completely fine to say it was good, but... That's what I did. It, it still has problems. But, like, my biggest problem is people who will just, like, keep, keep their in it, like... Let's say two years ago, I said One Piece live action will be horrible. And no matter what comes out, even though I myself might think it's actually like shaping up to be good, I'm just going to keep saying it was horrible because that's the take I put out initially and I must stick to it. Otherwise, I will be like flip-flopping in my opinion, you know? Whereas the thing is, people say, people throw out the word hypocrite a lot nowadays, right? The problem is everyone's a hypocrite and there's a difference between being a hypocrite and changing your opinion. There are a lot of people who have a problem with admitting that they're wrong and changing their opinion. That's the problem in my opinion. A lot of opinions, basically. To be honest with you, I don't really care. <laughs> like, I, I talk about it a lot, but I'm gonna be honest, I don't care. I liked it and that's all that matters for me. That's the beautiful thing about watching things. It's painful to admit you're wrong in an argument, uh, so I understand it. Yes, it is sometimes painful, but like whoever, like, any person who is willing to admit that they were wrong about anything automatically gets my respect. I love people who are like, you know what? Because it's like, to me, it's the ultimate showcase of one's maturity. If you're like, you know what? I think, I think maybe I was wrong. Maybe I just didn't understand what we were even talking about. To me, that just demonstrates a person's maturity 
and just like that they can actually look inwards and think about what they're even talking about. A lot of people get like really, really pigeonholed in a single, single opinion, you know? Yes, also that. Also just saying I don't know enough about this, so I'm not even going to talk about it. That is another thing I 100% respect. You don't need to have a take on everything. I think I am one of those people who finds it interesting to, to talk about a lot of things, you know? I like to talk about many different topics just because I enjoy discussion. That's why I have a YouTube channel, I think. I enjoy talking about random nonsense. It's what I enjoy, even though I am the dictionary definition of an introvert. If I find someone who is interesting to talk to, I can talk for hours about anything and everything. But there are things where I'm going to be like, you know what? I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm just not going to say a single thing. That is a very, very good take. Did you want to put We Are in more places in season one? If not, is the song coming for future seasons? Yes, th this is this is what I was about to say. Music rights are a very tricky thing. Yeah, yeah. So this will be interesting. Oh, so you know what this also means? I never uh, like I've always said there is no shot. They're adapting GA. There is absolutely no chance in hell. They're going to be adapting G8 because like we're already cutting things. There's no shot they're adapting a filler arc, but they literally don't even have the rights to it because G8 is written for Toei. So they can't even adapt it, even if they wanted to. I mean, technically, they could still buy the rights, probably, but it's just a waste of money, right? Uh, I knew I wanted a version of the song in the show somewhere. I think we found some great places for it. I'm sorry to those who wanted to hear more of the anime OST in the show, but I hope this helps explain why we didn't. Yes. Uh, s the soundtrack for, for One Piece is incredible. Which, by the way, uh, they put out like another jazzy mix of the Barati 8 soundtrack. It's so good. I recommend everyone listen to it. Uh, I've said this before, I have a wacky, goofy shuffle. It has like 500 songs or something on it, on Spotify. It's just everything mixed together. And I've added the entire One Piece live action soundtrack on it, it is great. Uh, my favorite take after the first trailer was uh, this one creator that said I saw the first uh, few episodes of One Piece, so I know One Piece really well, and the trailer doesn't feel like it, it'll be terrible. I mean, to be fair, and this is also something I think is actually valuable, I do think that like the opinion of someone looking um, from the outside in is very valuable, you know? Because with a series like One Piece, you will never get hardcore fans if they don't get past the start, you know? It's the same thing with JoJo. A lot of people say JoJo Part 1 and Part 2, well, Part 2 is already much, much better, but Part 1 is kind of mid. Like, some people like Part 1, and that's fine. I think Part 1 is the weakest of JoJo by a long, long stretch. By a long stretch. But the thing is... Jojo is one of my favorite series ever. And whenever I recommend Jojo, I don't want them to skip part one. But I always have to say, I know part one's kind of mid. But there are a lot of people who don't know that. So the opinion uh, opinion of someone who knows nothing about the uh, series and is going into something like live action One Piece and still says that the tone feels off, I think is valuable feedback. I don't think it's necessarily more or less important, uh, important than someone who knows the material. I just think it's valuable to keep in mind, you know? <laughs> it's very valuable until, uh, until you start getting people who are so far behind there, uh, they think they're leading in terms of how much they think uh, they're contributing to the conversation. Yes. Yes. I think it's always important to, like, um, to let everyone know how much you know, how long you've been following the series, what perspective you come from, all of these things, and then you can have an in-depth conversation. If you say, I know nothing about One Piece, and then, like, raise all of your concerns, I think that is a perfectly valid conversation to have. <laughs> Normie takes on One Piece are the most fascinating now that live action is out. Yes. I couldn't get past part two. I didn't enjoy part one either. Part three is when things get real good. Part two is good. Part three is really good. Part four is so good. Part five is so good. Part six, perfect. Part seven, even better. Part eight, for me, I want to see the anime. Part eight for me in the manga was kind of eh. Part eight of the manga was kind of weird. Anyway, there's a lot more to this. I'll link this in chat if you want to go through it yourself, uh, but the chapter is coming up. It's interesting to hear his thoughts on, on a variety of topics. And a lot of these obviously come from hardcore fans, so it's not just like an interview, uh, as we read that one. Because a lot of the interview questions are kind of what you would expect, right? It's like, what was the hardest part? Uh, what's, what's, what's your favorite part? What's this? Uh, oh, you need to start shooting this. What's going on with the writing? It's those sorts of things. Like questions like who is your favorite, who you wanted to, uh, who you want to adapt in the future, stuff like that. That is hardcore fan stuff. I like that.